can I convince you to believe that I still have another song inside me? I still have another sermon inside me. I still have another battle inside me. I still got some more good things I want to do for the nation. Hezekiah is weeping and he's crying out to God and he's praying. And watch this. Isaiah has left, right? He's walking out. He's walking out of the temple. How do I get out of here? There we go. He's walking. Isaiah's like, I'm not going to talk to Hezekiah about this. It's not my fault. I'm just the delivery boy. I just had to deliver the word. And as Isaiah is walking out the middle court, where's that scripture? Throw that scripture up. uh, 2 Kings 20, verse 4. 2 Kings 20, verse 4. And I want you to look at this. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, his body freezes. He's arrested. It's good to see you guys. I don't get to come back here that much. I love this crew right here. Come on, give it up for section B on the right side. Yeah, my man in the back. Isaiah freezes. I think he's looking at people in the temple, but he's hearing something from God. God has arrested Isaiah's attention. He says, go back. Go back. Isaiah, something just happened. I don't know how to explain it. I know I told you he was going to die. I know I told you his time was up but I need you to go back as soon as possible because when you left, I didn't expect it, but Hezekiah started weeping. And as he was weeping and you were walking, by the time you got to that place, his tears were touching heaven and his prayers were connecting with my presence. I feel like God is calling someone right now to pray for a different outcome. He says, Isaiah, go back. Go back. Go back and tell Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of your father, David. Look at that. He skips over a few generations. David wasn't his actual father. David was somewhere far back in the line. But Hezekiah had tapped into the spirit of David. What was the spirit of David? It was a man after God's own heart. David was not a perfect king. The man committed adultery and murder. But there was something about David that connected with God's heart. And you can't deny that. There was something about David that said, I know I got blood on my hands. I know I'm not the perfect man. But God, I am a lover of your presence. And God, I can't wait to be in your house. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. David had a heart of worship. He just wanted to be with God. And Hezekiah had tapped into that heart of worship when he started praying, when he started crying, when he turned his face to the wall. And so God says, Isaiah, go back. Go back to Hezekiah and tell him, I have heard your prayer. Look at that in verse four. He says, I've heard your prayer. Verse five, and I've seen your tears. God sees your tears, mom. God sees your tears, grand, grand. God's heard your prayer, John. God's heard your prayer, Paul. God's heard your prayer, Daniel. God's heard your prayer, Luke. God has seen your tears, Anna. God has seen what you've walked through. And he says, I'm with you. You're not alone in this. Things were gonna go one way, but when I got your attention, I'm now going to reverse the prophetic word that was spoken over you. He says, go back and tell him things have changed. Everybody say, things have changed. Plans have changed. He says, I'm going to heal you. I'm going to heal you. I'm going to raise you up on the third day. Come on, this is a shadow story right here. Old Testament stories are shadows of what's coming in the New Testament. It's just telling you what's coming because there's another man who's going to raise up on the third day. He says, on the third day, I'm going to raise you up from this sickbed. On the third day, somebody say the third day. 
He says, I've heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. And on the third day, I will heal you and you will get up from this sick bed and you will walk into the temple and you will worship the Lord. And I'm going to add 15 years to your life. God's about to add some years back to someone's life who has lost some years to some trouble and some toil. Somebody say, I'm getting it back. It's all coming back to me now. It's all coming back to me now. He says, I'm going to give you your years back. I'm going to add 15 years. And he says, I will deliver you. I will deliver you, not because you've been a good guy, but because I'm a good God. I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to deliver victory. I'm going to deliver your family. I'm going to deliver this city. I'm going to protect you. And the king of Assyria will not be able to touch you. That's right, Hezekiah. No weapon formed against you. It was formed, but it won't prosper. It was prepared, but it won't have its strong effect. It was sent to take you out. What was sent to break you, God is about to break through. What was sent to knock you out. Come on, who am I preaching to today? He says, I will defend you for my name's sake, for the sake of my name and for the sake of my servant, David. In other words, he remembered the covenant. When you're in a crisis, you need to remember your covenant. When you're in a crisis, you need to remember your covenant. The same covenant God made with David, the same covenant God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he has made with you. He is a good God. He is a promise keeper. He is a light in the darkness. He is a healer. He's a provider. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's the multiplier. But watch what Isaiah, (coughs) the prophet says. He says, prepare a poultice. What in the world is a poultice? We don't talk like that. That'd be kind of weird if I was like, give me a poultice from the cafe. You're like, I think that's a coffee. I'm not sure. (laughs) Go get me a poultice down there at the store. But uh, a poultice, a poultice was an ointment. He says, I want you to make an ointment, which also is powerful. God's going to heal you, but it won't just be through prayer. God's going to restore you, but it won't just be because you cried and you prayed. The poultice represented a practical step and a process. The poultice was this practical process of change. God's going to set you free from that sin, that addiction you've been stuck in that was sent to take you out. But God says, I, I've got a recovery program for you. I've got a, I've got a recovery step for you. And it's going to require a poultice. You want me to change things in your finances, but you haven't made a poultice. You haven't given me a tithe or an offering. You want me to change things in your marriage, but you haven't signed up for counseling. You want me to heal some things in your life, but you won't go through the poultice. There's a process. There's some practical things that are going to lead. You mix the practical and the spiritual, and you start to see a breakthrough. You mix the poultice and the prayers and the tears, and the healing begins to have its effect. And Hezekiah asks Isaiah, as they're putting the poultice of ointment on his boils, They're wrapping this ointment around all of his boils. Hezekiah looks at Isaiah and they're best friends. They've had a partnership all through Israel's time. And he says, what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me? How will I know that this sickness won't kill me? What will be the sign that that on the third day I'm going to get up and I'm going to worship God again? And Isaiah says, this is the Lord's sign to you. That the Lord will do what he promised he would do. God's going to fulfill his promise. Mary, nothing is impossible for God. Joshua, the walls are going to come down. Moses, the Red Sea still parts. The sun can still stand still. Lazarus, come out of that grave. He says, how will I know? Isaiah says, You want a sign? I'll give you a sign. Tell me what you want. Do you want me to ask the shadow to go forward 10 steps or shall the shadow go backwards 10 steps? Now they used a sundial system. I think we have a picture of what a sundial would look like back then. But as you look at this sundial, 
This is how they would measure time during the day. When the shadow hit certain parts in a person's palace or house, or they would know, oh, it's 3 p.m. The shadow is setting, and the more the shadow goes forward, the more the day is running out of time. So get this picture with me. Just imagine this. Isaiah the prophet is telling Hezekiah at the beginning of this passage, you're running out of time. The hourglass is running out of sand. The shadow is setting on your life. This is your final chapter, bro. Get your house in order. It's all over. So the shadow is setting. After Hezekiah prays, seeks God, God says, all right, I'm going to give you 15 more years of life. He says, what do you want me to tell the shadow to do? Do you want me to tell the shadow to go forward 10 steps? Do we want to spring forward or do we want to fall back? That's really the question here. And 10 steps would be about an hour, by the way, if you were to look this up, it's almost an hour. And Hezekiah says this, he says, it's a simple matter in verse 10 for the shadow to go forward. That's what shadows do. Shadows set on people's lives. By the way, we're all gonna die at some point. You're like, thanks, Paul. But Hezekiah knows I'm gonna die someday. I'm not gonna live to be 3,000 years old, but I'm not gonna die now. That's the point. I know I'm gonna die someday, but I don't have to die today. I know there is an end to my season as king, but it's not over yet. Somebody say, it's not over yet. I'm going to finish in victory. I think God wants you to finish 2023 in victory. I think God wants you to finish 2023 in prosperity. I think God wants to redeem what the devil sent to destroy you this year. I think God wants to turn some things around. So he says, it's simple for the shadow to go forward, Isaiah. Ask God if the shadow will reverse. Ask God if he'll turn back the clock. Ask him if he'll reverse what's been happening for the worst. I just see someone's cancer is going back. It's in remission. It's in remission. Someone's sickness is in remission. Someone's shadow is in remission. Someone who has been looking at something and you're going, is there any way this can change? Is there any way this can change? God is in the business of doing supernatural changes. God is in the business of changing people's outcomes. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Faith is believing that what is current is not permanent, even though it looks bad right now. Isn't it interesting that faith and fear both ask the same question, to believe in something that hasn't happened yet. Fear wants you to believe you're going to die. Faith wants you to believe you're going to live. Fear wants you to believe God can't come through. Faith wants you to believe God will come through. Fear wants you to believe this is the end of the road for your finances. Faith wants you to believe my God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the oil underneath it. And my God shall provide all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus.